So my name's uh, Ryan Thorpe, and I went to college at Brigham Young University, BYU. And then after there, I did medical school back home in Texas. It's where I grew up. My internship year was actually at Sacred Heart in Spokane, Washington. And then in, I did residency at Duke University in North Carolina, and then fellowship was in, in Pennsylvania. So I've kind of been all over, and now we've been in Idaho now two years, and we love it. So I was actually a third year medical student, and I had a patient who had a skin cancer on his lower lip called a squamous cell carcinoma. And it was uh, that patient, I was just amazed by the whole process. He was cured of cancer, he had no lip, he needed a new lip, and they did something which I've now learned is called a mucosal advancement flap, where they take the inside of the lip and are able to recreate the lower lip. I thought that was just fascinating. So I asked where I could learn more about this, and I said, well, you should really go talk to the dermatologist. Specifically, you should go talk to the most surgeons. So that's what I did that same day. I was at the VA in Dallas, Texas, and I went and found the dermatology department. Their clinic was over. There were a couple of dermatology residents still there. I told them who I was, what I wanted, and uh, the rest is history. So I set up an appointment with the chair of the department, and, and before long, I was doing lupus research on the skin. And that's what kind of put me on the path that led to dermatology and then Mohs surgery. Lupus is where you, you meet so many criteria. Uh, to be, it's an autoimmune disease. And like almost half a dozen of the criteria are actually cutaneous or skin related. And there's one type of cutaneous lupus called discoid lupus erythematosus. And I spent that summer looking at uh, biopsies from DLE patients and trying to categorize the infiltrate the goal was to say, hey, if we can identify which cells are in the skin that are part of this disease, maybe we can actually learn to both understand it and treat it better. So we did it. We did a. So that that was my first publication in dermatology. Was actually in the specific inflammatory mediates of discoid lupus erythematosus. And I, I think if I never had that patient who had that skin cancer on his lip, I definitely wouldn't have realized that it had everything I wanted. You know, I thought I thought it was going to be north. So. Really another answer to your question is like, I thought I was going to do orthopedic surgery and I think I would have loved it. I don't think I would have not loved it. Um, I, I liked, I liked it a lot, but it wasn't until I had that patient at the VA with the cancer on his lip where he like, they cured the cancer and fixed the lip and he went home cancer free with a lip that worked. He could talk, eat. And I just thought to myself, that's cool. And that's when I started learning a little about most surgery and decided that's what I wanted to do. I think one of the, Things that I would say that I learned most from that is, is I think a lot of us, including myself, kind of have the idea that we've got everything figured out. But the truth is we're still learning. We're still learning about how to, how to treat disease and, and how to um, understand it better. And so um, since that point, I've done research on uh, everything from psoriasis to disease in, in different populations to melanoma to... Um, reconstructive techniques of how to help people heal best after skin cancer surgery. And so I think the biggest thing that I learned from that project specifically was just the idea that we, there's still so much more for us to learn and that there are lots of, there is lots of improvement to uh, be better as, as doctors and as a field. You know, most surgery is one of those things that you definitely need to read lots of books that's not going to get you very far. It's more important to learn from good teachers. Um, I was very fortunate um, to learn from what I think are some of the best uh, in the business, so to speak. Uh, first, I was with a guy named Jonathan Cook. He's a Mohs surgeon at Duke University, um, one, of, one of the best around. And I was, I was pretty humbled one day because he said, he made a comment. He said that he, 99% of the repairs he does, he's unsatisfied with. And at the time I thought to myself, you're crazy because it's flawless. I mean, he's just amazing. He's, he's both talented, but also smart. He's dedicated, he's ethical. I thought this guy is off his rocker. Um, but the truth is, uh, I, I, as I've now done this thousands of times myself, um, there is something about trying to be, uh, that, that attitude that I learned from him about pushing to try to be excellent every time and there's something you can actually get better and learn from even if you've done something thousands of times but so i first learned some of the te those techniques most surgery from him and then i was fortunate enough to go train with john zatelli and dave broadland 
Um, Dr. Zatelli trained with Fred Mose. He's who Mose surgery is named after. Um, when Dr. Mose first started doing the Mose technique, it's very different than what we do now. The concept was the same. The concept was, let's look at more of what's removed, more of the margin to get a higher cure rate. And at the time he was a heretic. People thought he was um, offering substandard care, but the truth is, is as time has gone on, and now it's been repeated millions of times, um, Mohs micrographic surgery gives the highest cure rate um, for almost any cancer, any location of the body. Now, of course, it's not approved for all cancers in all locations of the body, but certainly high-risk tumors in high-risk areas or in high-risk patients, or any combination of those three, Mohs micrographic, micrographic surgery is the gold standard, and it's because of people like Fred Mohs. But learning under John Zatelli and Dave Broadland, um, definitely learned more and more. And obviously as a young surgeon, you, you go to conferences, you, you try to stay up to date on the literature. And the most important thing is to just do it. And so both in residency and in fellowship to be able to just have an opportunity to practice with some of the greats is I think what helped me um, become who I am today. But I can now look back at what Dr. Cook taught me and, and say, you know what, there's, it's never, never be satisfied and say, okay, this is enough, but just keep working, keep trying to become better and better for your patients. So I think patients react, patients react to skin cancer um, in lots of different ways. Um, it depends on if it's their first time ever getting skin cancer or not. If they've had it before, they know that we're gonna be able to help them get through it. If they've never had skin cancer, then, um, Simple education can really help calm the nerves. Most skin cancer is easily treatable. It's usually just a local problem. Um, unfortunately, it's more serious and it takes a more um, aggressive approach and it takes other uh, specialists combined with dermatologists to help treat. Uh, but I think for people that it's their first time, definitely a little bit of anxiety and fear. Um, usually we're able to make that better though pretty quickly just by kind of teaching and helping them learn what they need to do to get this cured. Right, so depending on what type of skin cancer you have, there's pretty well set standards of care for how often you need to go to the dermatologist to get checked. Um, I think one of the most common things that I see almost on a daily basis is when I'm treating somebody for skin cancers, uh, usually another doctor or provider has sent that patient to me to treat their skin cancer. They always make the comment, I wasn't even worried about this spot. I was worried about this spot over here. And oftentimes, um, I mean, I hear that every single day. And I think if you are at high risk, meaning you've had sunburns, blistering sunburns as a child, um, you've been, on, been around for more than just a few years here on, on the earth, then you're, it's worth a skin check, a full skin exam, just to see and make sure that there's nothing that needs treatment. The nice thing about skin cancer is that skin as an organ takes a beating. I mean, it it's, uh, protects us from the outside world, it protects us from disease and infection. It's a barrier that keeps everything together and it also bears the brunt of UV damage. And so it, it takes a beating, but the, the best thing about it is that it can be seen. You can see it. it we, we can't pull out other organ systems that you have and look at them. Whereas with the skin, we can look at it. And so that's one of the benefits of being a dermatologist. We can see, see the organ system that we've been trained uh, to treat. And so skin cancers are often caught early when they're easily treatable and 100% curable. And that's definitely something that I love about what I do is almost every patient uh, that I do treat, you're able to cure. And you can't say that about other uh, cancers. Uh, what do I wish patients understood better? Honestly, I feel like we just have great patients that seem to understand and soak everything in. Um, I would say one thing that we always try to help teach our patients, my whole team, is just that we've done this before. We've done this before thousands of times. I promise we can get you through this. I promise it's not going to be near as scary as you think. It can often actually be a very pleasant experience where we're able to um, pain control, manage that. We're able to get you through surgery. We're able to get you cured. We're able to get you cure, uh, 
healed. And I'd say almost always, patients always remark like, oh, that was not near as bad as I thought. I would say, if anything, I wish that on the front end they didn't have quite so much anxiety that we could help them assuage that before they get here instead of having to go through it and then with hindsight look back and say, okay, yeah, you're right. When you're looking for your dermatologist, the truth is all of it matters. Where did they train? How did they train? Are they kind? Do they have uh, patients that will vouch for them, that will say good things about them? Um, I think it's worth getting somebody who is kind, who's pushing uh, to um, the knowledge barrier, so to speak, somebody who's trying to give back to the field. I think all of that matters. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to be with somebody that you're, that you're comfortable with. I think generally you'll know that even after just one visit. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that in medicine, sometimes being on this side of things as a resident, every once in a while you'd hear a patient say, oh, that doctor, I didn't like that doctor. I would never go back to that doctor. And in my mind, as the resident who knows what that doctor knows and knows how well that doctor treats people, sometimes I'd be floored because I would say, well, that's actually the best doctor here. But you didn't like their bedside manner. I think obviously the, the perfect world would be where you want the whole package. Somebody who's also both well-trained, uh, knows what they're doing, is skilled at their job, but also somebody who's kind, who you feel like you could get along with and trust. Obviously, that's what you want. Um, gratefully, I think here in Treasure Valley, both in our practice and outside of our practice, I think there's lots of dermatology doctors and other providers that fit that bill. And so, and gratefully, I think, I think you'll probably be fine wherever you go in the Valley. Um, obviously, I'm biased towards Ada West Dermatology and our team that we've built. And so I, I think that some of the biggest strengths of Ada West Dermatology, when you have these, this many people who are this well-trained, it pushes me to be better. Um, but we've got an, another Mohs surgeon who, you know, trained at Mayo, everybody knows that name in medicine, or we've got uh, dermatopathologists that were trained at Dartmouth, and we have uh, physicians that served in the military, and we've got uh, PAs that's, that trained with, um, you know, one that trained with Dirk Elston, who's the uh, head of the American Academy of Dermatology at one point, and is the current editor of JAD, which is our premier uh, journal. I mean, they're just uh, smart, kind, ethical, well-trained people, and we work together. So often uh, people will ask me my opinion on this issue, or, or I'll reach out to other people and say, hey, listen, I got this patient with this. Can we, any other thoughts or ideas? Um, it's especially helpful because we take call for the hospital system. And even just last night, I was chatting with one of the other doctors about uh, something he was consulted on. And uh, it's just a huge strength. It's one of those situations where one plus one equals three. And I think Ada West Dermatology has that. Ooh, that's a good question. One myth that never seems to die about skin health. Uh, certainly vitamin D is important and you, uh, People say moderation all things, and I think that's true too of the sun. Uh, but one, one thing that's been hard sometimes, even with patients that have skin cancer after skin cancer, is to convince them that uh, the UV rays they've received in their lifetime contributes to their skin cancers. Most, most patients agree with that and believe it and buy it, uh, but some don't. And I'd say uh, usually it's, not an issue, but on occasion, you'll have a, a patient who's had a melanoma, uh, a cancer that can kill you, and yet they're continuing to tan and to go to the tanning beds. And that gives me a little bit of anxiety as a doctor. Gratefully, it's not all too common, but it's certainly something we see all the time. Right now, I've got a manuscript that I've submitted to the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, or the JAD, and it's about melanoma, specifically um, historically, we, we, we predicted the future of melanomas and tried to decide who needs sentinel lymph node biopsy or who needs chemo or now immunotherapy, who needs CT scans based on characteristics of the biopsy. And so that biopsy gives you lots of things, but a couple of the biggest things is it tells you how deep it is. And that's called Breslow thickness. And it tells you whether or not it's ulcerated. 
tells you if the cells are splitting fast. They call it the mitotic index. Or it tells you if it's invaded into blood vessels or lymphatic channels. And all of these things together help us predict the future of, of an individual patient's risk of metastasis, which then helps guide you into decision-making of what that patient needs in terms of testing, imaging, blood work, et cetera. And so one of the new tools that has come out though is something called the Gene Expression Profile, where they actually take that and they look at the expression of, of three dozen genes, and it's called the Gene Expression Profile Test. And I did a, a project where I, what I did is I, I looked at about 1,200 melanoma patients who had both their pathology report and their gene expression profile test. And basically the goal was this one predicts, this one predicts, but if you combine the two, can you predict even better? And it turns out you can. And what we did is we put together something called a nomogram. A nomogram is where you ascribe points to all these things and you can plug it in to like say, eventually, hopefully an app. And you can then tell the patient, this is your one year, five year risk of metastasis or survivability based on your melanoma. And it will just guide you further. So more than just having the path or just having the gene expression profile test, if we can combine the pathology with the genetics, uh, we can be a little bit more individualistic and a little bit more specific, a little bit good at predicting whether or not a patient needs further workup. And that's really helpful. For example, and it could be go both ways. So let's say you're 85 years old, you've got a melanoma that's thick, and you think, gee, I better do my lymph node test, I better do my CT scans. Well, there's risks associated with that. If the genetic test actually says, look, you're really low risk, well, when you combine those, maybe we could save somebody some surgery procedures they don't need. Um, conversely, though, let's say, you know, just for, for grins, let's say you're 35 years old and it's only a 0.3 Breslow melanoma. That's not a very thick one, that's a thin one. We'd say you're very low risk. But we do the genetics test and you're high risk. Well, we can combine that and say, listen, based on your age, we can better predict your sentinel lymph node positivity. We can better predict the, the metastatic risk. And it's a completely different uh, conversation to have. And by combining that, by becoming better at prognosticating the future, maybe we can help guide patients, protect some from surgeries they don't need, but encourage others that probably wouldn't have done it had you not said, hey, look, if you take it all into account, they might save somebody's life, and that's the end goal. So we love Idaho. So I actually have my, my great-grandparents, my grandparents grew up in Shelley and Rigby, Idaho. My great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and great-great-great-grandparents are all buried in eastern Idaho. So I have some Idaho roots. I think, uh, we were in Pennsylvania, North Carolina for training, and we have five kids. We've got a lot of family out west, and so we were looking to come out here, and this uh, opportunity opened up right at the right time, and we just love Idaho. We love mountain biking in the summer and skiing in the winter. We love going to the mountains. Uh, the coast isn't too far away. We've got a lot of family in northern Utah. Um, I'm a big BYU football fan, so with them going to the Big 12, I have a little bit of nostalgia saying, gee, if I was still in Texas where I grew up, I'd go to a lot of football games. Um, but we're not that far from, from Provo, so we're able to do all of it. I think this um, it's a big enough city to have everything that I would want, but it's small enough that you still feel like you've got this uh, small town feel. It's a little bit of a Goldilocks situation, not too hot, not too cold, not too big, not too small, yeah. not too hot, you know, uh, of weather, it's, it's really a Goldilocks situation recreationally. Um, and as far as raising kids, I mean, it's a little bit of a safe haven, I think. The world's a bit crazy right now, and there's a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, we feel fairly grateful to be in Idaho, and we love our neighborhood, love our neighbors, don't anticipate leaving ever. My best health practice, I wish I could say it was sleeping, it's not. Um, I wish I could say it's eating right. I've gotten a lot better because of my wife. Um, my wife's helped encourage me to be a better eater. But I exercise fairly regularly. I would say at least you know three times a week, whether I'm running or biking or lifting weights. Um, historically, if I was gonna exercise, it was gonna be like chasing a ball. So like I love basketball, I still do. I'm a little bit more careful nowadays with my hands and my fingers. Um, but I love to mountain bike. Even then, though, got to be pretty careful with that, too. 
I don't take take a spill, so I don't go I don't go hardcore down the mountain at all. But a um, little bit of speed's okay. But I would say I, I'm I'm pretty proud of the fact that I exercise three times a week. Between uh, family and work and church, exercising three times a week is something I can be proud of. Yeah. Ooh, so I probably I grew up 20 minutes south of the Dallas Fort Worth airport. So I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan, Dallas Mavericks fan, Texas Rangers fan, all thing North Texas sports. Um, it probably depends on the time of year, but right now it's definitely Dallas Cowboys. Is, is probably which works out because Boise State has so many players. Kellen Moore is our offensive coordinator at the moment. So I'm holding out hope that uh, when Mike McCarthy, who's the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, does retire, that Kellen Moore, Boise State, obviously great Hall of Fame college football quarterback can take the reins as the head coach and then I'll have something to talk about with patience forever because they'll always be Cowboys fans because Kellen Moore is the man there. Drew's <laughs> good uh, influences in sports and church and scouts. I would just say just take it in. Take in all our advice. They all gave me good advice. Work hard, be nice, be honest, uh, get outside of yourself, go serve somebody, um, push yourself, try and be best you can be. Um, I definitely put a little, maybe too much pressure on myself at some times, but I can't say I regret it because I'm just really grateful how things turned out. So um, I couldn't be happier to be honest. Be a professional athlete, of course, you know, pro or something, basketball, baseball, football, I wouldn't care. I'd be a professional athlete. Um, truthfully, and that was never in the cards, you know, but I, I'm definitely, I don't think I could ever do it. Um, but I, I'm really inspired. I love reading uh, like historical nonfiction and reading about some of like the heroes we have, uh, both in our military or other military, and like listening to like this pursuit of excellence for some of these special ops units. I don't think I could ever do it, but it's definitely something that like inspires me. Um, I met in the past, I, I met some Air Force pilots that, you know, fly an F-16 or something like that. And I think to myself, like, you, how do you top that? So if I could be a fighter pilot, I think that'd be pretty cool. I don't think I have enough bravery or courage to ever do it, but that's probably, I'd probably try and do something like that. Um, most of my patients now, right now, think I'm too young to do this, you know? So they'll say, how, how long have you done this? And uh, I think, Usually I tell them that I have five kids and that seems to make them think, okay, well, he's got five kids. He must be old enough to do this. So that's something that they seem to be surprised by. Um, so that's what I tell them. And uh, then I, you know, of course I tell them I've done it thousands of times and they feel even better still. But, yeah. but still, I think they're surprised because they, they think I'm maybe just too young. I just use sunscreen. That's it. I'm actually 65 years old. So. Oh, um, I don't know. I was going to say boring, but that, maybe that's lame. Uh, honest would be good. Kind. 